If we feel that we're stuck and we can't do anything, get your body to start moving. Move some part of your body. Don't say, well, I'm too tired or whatever. Start, start where you are. Do what you can and see what happens. If you're looking for something, you find it. You really do, but you have to keep looking. Sometimes it takes a long time, but keep looking. Don't get up. When it comes to your longevity, you're 102 years old. You've lived this magnificent life. I'm sure there are so many different factors that have contributed, but if you had to pick the biggest key, what would you say that is? Love is the great healer. Okay. Talk more about that. Without love, it, they're just, you, it's, it's almost impossible to really connect and to really live a full life without having love into it, live into the essence of it. So love is the great healer of all times, <laughs> past and future. Well, I do love that, but I want to make sure I fully understand what you're getting at with that, because a lot of people tuning in, myself included, may be saying to themselves, I have a lot of love in my life, a lot of great people, family, friends. I feel like I love myself. But what is it we're looking for when it comes to love? Okay, let me talk. I talk about five L's that try to explain it, because trying to explain love to a person who has never experienced it is, is probably like trying to tell a person who was blown who was born blind what the color green is it's you have to actually experience love to know something about it so it's a very difficult thing to explain but i think i have five l's that i think help to explain it somewhat first L is that life itself is dependent on it. You can have a seed in the pyramid for 5,000 years, and all the life of the universe is within that seed, but it can't do anything until water and sunshine and some action of lack that would be considered love breaks the shell and life can begin to act. So life is dependent on love. It's, it's as is uh, all of our things actually are, have their, their basis in love as human beings. So we, if, if we can connect life with love that way they are a unit, it's like a pregnancy. When a woman is pregnant, that baby is part of her. They are one unit. They are not separate units. They are one. But when that baby is born and takes his first breath, he takes, he, she take on the responsibility of their own being, and they become a separate unit. It's that reality of claiming your life moving into it and then say, I am Gladys McGarry. You know, I am who I am when I take my first breath. And so life and love are a unit like that. The next L, these five Ls, next L, third one, is laughter. Laughter without love is cruel. It's mean. It, it, it injures people. But laughter with love is joy and happiness. And the fourth one is drudgery. Drudgery, it's, it's, it's labor. Labor is drudgery. It's, oh man, I've got to go to work. There are too many diapers. This is just a really hard thing to do. But drudgery, uh, I mean, labor with love becomes bliss. It's why you do what you do. It's why I do. You work yourselves. <laughs> you know, you, you, the drudgery part of it kind of flies away because the joy and bliss of who and what and where, what it is that you're doing is what takes over. 
And the fifth one is listening. Listening without love is a, just a gong that you don't, you know, it's it's useless, it's empty, it's just there, it's just empty sound. But listening with love is understanding. So as we put these five L's together, we can have kind of a, a platform from which to sort of uh, structure, and not exactly, but to sort of pattern our lives and move forward in ways that we choose to do. It's then dependent on what we choose, how we choose to use love. But love is a great, great healer, always has been. The ancients have always known that the Bible starts out with God is love. It's that whole reality of the inner aspect of our true human being, of us as true human beings. One of the things I took from your book is the fact that there's a real importance that you put behind self-love. And to me, it sounds like that's the beginning to this whole thing. So can you talk more about that piece? I think it's essential. If we don't even recognize who and what we are, uh, then how, how can we do anything? Um, I was 93 years old when I recognized my that my own voice had some reason to be saying the things I'd been saying all these years. Because uh, when I, and I think this happens, to millions of people, not just just the, the, the way it happened to me. But when I started school, I became aware of the fact that I couldn't read. Other people could read and, and write, and I couldn't. The num numbers and, and uh, the alphabet just floated all over the page. I was so severely dyslexic that I just, there was not a word for it. Nobody knew what it, how, what to call it. But I was the dumb one in the class. I was a stupid one. And so for I went through first grade. I didn't learn to read. I had to repeat first grade. I still didn't learn to read. For two years, I was in the school system, the stupid one. At home, it was a different factor. At home, I was recognized for who I was, and it was wonderful. I had no issues there, but at school it was it was a nightmare, and so I carried that with me all through my life. I I did the part that I had to do, which was a burning issue within my body. I had to speak these things, but I was constantly asking for someone else to validate what I had said. I'd ask Bill to go through the book that I'd read, written or, help, or, you know, ask somebody to come on validate that these were, that it was okay. I just couldn't understand that until I was 93 years old. And I had a dream. Now, my dreams have been really, really instructive to me. I've paid attention to my dreams. They are a part of my inner being by which and with which I com communicate with myself. So this dream was that I woke up uh, on a Sunday morning knowing, sort of singing and laughing. I mean, it was just that kind of a wake up. And I knew it was a Sunday morning. And I was still in and out of the dream. So I was, saw myself as nine-year-old Gladys in the jungles of North India, peeking out of the tent to make sure that my younger brother wasn't out there. Because if he, if he saw me do what I was going to do, he'd tattle on me and I'd be in trouble because I knew what I, was, what I wanted to do. In our family, we were not allowed to sing any songs except hymns and pudgeons on Sunday mornings. But I thought that was, I, I wanted to sing what I wanted to sing. He wasn't anywhere around. 
So I climbed as fast as I could up to the top of the tree. And I'm sitting in the top of the tree, and I'm seeing any old ca thing, a caterpillar song or whatever. But I'm just having a ball. And every so often, I turn and look over my right shoulder, and Jesus is up in the tree with me. And I look at him, and he's laughing. He's really laughing. And I look at him, and I say, Jesus loves the little children, right? And Jesus says, yes. So I go back to the singing, and I'm going on. And then I get to thinking, did he really say yes? You know. So I go back, and I say, I'm still a little children, right? And he laughed again. And he said, yes. And I woke up laughing and singing and immediately knew that I had to claim my voice that all these years when I had been so, sort of deflecting the, what I had said, I was in essence denying it. I had written the books, people were getting something from it all, but in essence, in my core, I was saying, yeah, that's true because that's, and I have to say it, but do I have it right? You know, constantly. After that, I, I, accepted it, because I knew that the voice that I had was important, and it was important for me to claim it, to actually claim it, and then speak it. So, you know, it it's that kind of inner communication with ourselves that I think is so easily... Um, not listened to, you know, sort of brushed off. It's easy to say to a child, oh, well, that's just a dream. Don't pay any attention. Uh-uh. I think I, with, with all my children, we paid attention to our dreams. So you gave us this great story of, of having this dream at 93 and how that's a catalyst for, you know, changing your life from that point forward and opening up and, and fully loving yourself. For somebody who is in a similar boat to what you were before that, and they're just going about living their life right now, and and they feel like they haven't reached that point that you talk about after having the dream, how can they go about having that realization in their own life? Start looking for it. Start looking for the light. If you if you don't look for it, you'll never see it. Uh, it's it's also I think that all of it, I don't know. I think that I have a flashlight that I kind of shine along the path. And when it's, when it's dark and night, I can still have that path that the flashlight takes me if one step at a time and one step at a time. One. And I can walk that path and, and be aware of what it is that I'm doing there. But as I'm doing that, I feel that it's part of my um, path to pay attention to what's on the other side of the flashlight. There may be a, a light, a, a small glimmer of light someplace along the line, and if I take my flashlight and point it towards that flashlight, their whole light comes open, and. It's, it can be, we're, we're inter, we need each other. We, we are walking a path by ourselves, but if we're walking a lonesome path and in the darkness, we can start looking for another light that can come and shine in with us and give us some more insight. The, you know, there's a, my eyes are, are very, you know, I can't depend on them now. 102. I have to listen to audio books I can't read because I, my eyes aren't good. But my insight has gotten much better. So, you, you know, it's that awareness as we travel, we, t we can look for what we're looking for, and it's right there. It'll, or it'll come to us. We have to start looking for it. If we're in a dark place, start looking for the light. And it any way that the light can come to you. 
and it will come to you in your own way. I've got another good story about that. Please share it. I had a really good friend. Uh, he was uh, in his 90s, and his dementia stepped in, and, and so he was. Uh, we had a really nice uh, home that he was in. They were, they were taking care of him and everything, but he really didn't. You know, he was slipping into this dementia, and I gave him a little plant that I took over to him, to him, and I said, James, now, you take care of this. You, you, you do water it. You take care of this. And he nodded. He nodded his head. And uh, when I came back, he, a couple of few days later, he was so happy. He said, you know, I have a magic box in my room. And he said, look here. And he takes me over to the <laughs> box that contained the air conditioning, pro uh, you know, the, the, it, it was taking care of his air conditioning in the room. He says, I come here, I push this button, and it gets cool. And my plant likes that. And I push this button, and it gets hot, and the plant doesn't like that. It droops, and all of a sudden, this little plant made a connection to his spirit that allowed him to begin to connect to something outside himself. It's that kind of a reality that we're all connected. In some way, our spirit can reach out to someone else who is just a little plant. <laughs> and it's that inter awareness of life you know my my oldest son is a retired orthopedic surgeon he came to through phoenix and um, he was on his way to del rio texas to start his practice in in orthopedics and he said mom you know i'm real scared i'm going into the world i'm going to have people's lives in my hands I, I don't know if I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be scared. But you have been trained in an amazing process of, that will help other people to do their own, do the healing. And you could, you know, so you use your orthopedics, which are so important for us who will have da damaged parts and will need you. But when you've done your job the best of you that you can, you then turn the healing part of it over to the physician within the patient who does the real healing. So you now have a colleague, the colleague who really helps with the whole healing process is the physician within each patient, because the physician within you and that physician within the patient are now connected because you care about that patient. It's that reality of the life itself, life force, which is love, connecting with life force, which is the part of the whole universal you love at atmosphere. As you share that story about your friend and giving him houseplant and giving him that responsibility and something to look, to look after, it got me thinking about that being a piece to our well-being and possibly longevity. And the way I'm relating this is to the fact that you wrote this book and you're 102 years old and you continue to create and and have such a meaningful purpose in life. So what I'm getting at with all this, whether it be through taking care of a houseplant, writing a book and and doing podcast interviews at 102, how big of a piece for health and longevity is this sense of purpose? Essential. It's essential. Uh we, I, I think a lot of times people don't 
think that they're worth anything. You know that they, it's life is here and it's tough and it's and nobody cares and I'm all alone and you know you can build that up and and create create a a really dark place for yourself. But if you can understand that you're here for some some special purpose that no one else can take. A jigsaw puzzle has every piece is important. If you do a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and you're finished it, but you have one piece missing, you'll drive yourself crazy trying to find that one piece because each one of us has a very special place that no one else fits into. No one else can be Gladys McGarry. She is who she is. You are who you are. And no matter how much we we talk or work together or uh, well, imagine <laughs> being able to do this together, you know, speak this way is awesome. When we didn't even have telephones when I was growing up, it's it's that kind of life reaches for life. It, it it needs to move. It needs to be part of what's going on in the universe. I have a, my own theory about things. You see, I, I think that when God created, God, whoever God is to each one of us, when God created the earth and the, the universe, he also created the human beings. And he said to us as human beings, now I've done this and it's really good, this universe of ours. Here it is. I now give you dominion over this. And you, this is your, because you as human beings can choose, you have your own will, nothing else can do this. You have the right to choose and to use your your own will to do, to do the things. And we, as who we were and are, decided that what he was, what he meant instead of dominion was dominance. In other words, you you, I'm giving these things to you, and you can do what you want to with them. Uh uh-uh. uh. Dominion means you take care of. Dominance means that, boy, I can do, you know, what I want to with this because I can dominate the whole thing. We humans have done that. Well, I think now, and I, I think we as human beings are really beginning, you know, we've been doing it for a long time, that we're really re-looking for our true humanity. I think when E.T. was wanting to go home, he was wanting to go back to his true humanity. And I'm finding that people are beginning to reach back and, and, and look for the light. You never see the light if you don't look for it. You won't see what it is that's, that's within yourself until you look for it. But boy, when you see it and you understand what it is, it just lights up everything. For somebody who hears that and feels like they haven't grasped that in their own life, finding that light and, and really harnessing it, how do they begin to do that work? Just begin to say to yourself, see, um, a lot of times I, I have to talk to myself into doing something, okay? Sometimes they're just by saying, look for the light, means a huge thing to me. It may mean nothing for anybody else, but if, you, but you've, if you've heard it once, you'll, you'll hear it again, and you'll think, oh, maybe that's what I heard, look for the light. And then, and then you begin to, and then somebody else says something like that. In other words, if you begin to look for movement, because life has to move, 
and life has to grow. If it stops, it dies. So if you begin to look for the light, lift, look for the love, look for the, look for someone else who's struggling the path the way you are. So maybe there's somebody else sitting by the side of the of the road. I mean, the, the path of life, not just the highway. Well, they may be there too, but there, people when people around us are suffering. And we can see that we, it's, uh, it's our joy and our bliss to reach out to them with some hope and some, something that they can begin to uh, build on. It may take them a long time. You know, it took me a long time to really get over the pain of, being the dumb one and the stupid person, and realized that I had a voice that needed that I needed to speak out so that it was heard. But that you know, ninety-five years is a long time. Ninety-three, I ninety-three years. <laughs> Coming back to that part of your story and and having that dream and that realization at ninety-three. Finding your voice. Talk specifically about how your life changed. In relation to that, at that point, I think that's what this new book is all about. It took a long time to write that, but you know, I think when I when I began to really pay attention to the fact that I was saying these things, and they were in my world, they were true. Then I began to claim them, and it took. It's taken time to live the path and work through different aspects of life and death and joy and sorrow and, you know, like life dishes out to us. It's taken a, a deeper meaning. That's why the new book is, is here. You've touched on this movement piece. And I want to get more into the nuance of what that is. This is one of the secrets of health in your book. All life needs to move. Talk more about what you're getting at with that. Well, I told you the story about James and his plant. Plants, if you have a rose bush climbing a trellis and it gets to a spot where something is in the way or it stops, It'll die. If it can't move forward, it dies. If life can't move forward, it dies. It's it's um, constantly moving. Like for instance, our bl the blood in our bloodstream. If that stops, either by being cut and having not, not enough blood or what, but having some kind of a clot or something. It, it has to move. The heart has to move. Our hands have to move. You know, if we, if we feel that we're stuck and we can't do anything, get your body to start moving. Move some part of your body. I have a, a tricycle. I can't ride it right now because it's 116 outside here in Phoenix. But it's, it's um, there for me to ride because, and and, and I, when I walk around, I have a, a walker that I use because it helps me. These are things that allow me to keep moving. And it's a, um, and, and, and if I can't do that for whatever reason at the time, I can almost always get my knitting needles out and knit because I can knit, uh, Wash little washcloths to give away and all that kind of stuff, but they keep my hands moving. My hands have to keep moving. Um, if you can't move anything else, try moving your ears. You know, wiggle your ears, or it just do. I'm just be, being foolish, but it's it's that kind of thing. What can I move? You know, uh, pick up a pencil and start doodling, and you might even make. A, a really nice drawing or something. It's that awareness 
that your life is reaching for something, and if you can't identify it, try to try to figure out what your body is telling you, because your body is a huge teacher. It's a huge we we our body, mind, and soul, like the tricycle, has to be in tune with each other in order for us to move. And so it just be take the, the truths that other people have ac- ac- accepted and are pointing out and find your own truth within that truth. And part of what I got from that movement piece, as you explained, we can start out small where we're at. For some people, they might not be moving at all right now. It can be it can be knitting, it can be doodling. Just start somewhere and get that inertia going, which reminds me of a story you share in the book of a patient of yours. And this patient had two young kids at home and she was depressed and she couldn't really get herself self up and moving during the day. And can you talk more about that lady and, and how you helped her? Well, you know, uh, I had so many patients who have had the same uh, issue. And it's, it's when she began um, understanding that when I told her to go home and rest, I didn't mean stop doing anything. To go home and rest is to do something. You go home and you rest and you take a nap or you do what you have to do and then you get up and you do what you have to do. But the reality with her was that she had she had these lovely children, but she wasn't even allowing herself to enjoy what they were enjoying. And so when she began focusing back on what her kids were doing and what was happening, she began to realize, wow, you know, these are wonderful people. And uh, and she came, began, she came back to life. But it was taking her, her life juice, and which she had minimized to the point of being useless, and realized that tickling the baby's tummy was a giggling thing. And, and if she could giggle with her, you know, it's that kind of movement of life taking what's there and making it alive. The little plant, the little child, the the neighbor next door, anything that you see that is alive and is maybe has some meaning for you and then connect yourself to that and see what happens. And I'm telling you what happens, it's a big wow. It's, it's, Oh, my, yes. You know, you take a deep breath and your body begins to feel alive again. Coming to the title of your book, The Well-Lived Life, as somebody who is 102 years old, as you look back on all the years and, and the different ways you've spent your time and energy, what are you've alluded to them and touched on different pieces through love and movement, areas that we should be focusing on, but when you look back at the long life you've lived, what are the best uses of your time? Where is the best investment for people to be spending their the extra time they have? For me, it, it has always been <clears throat> connecting with other people that uh, uh, are reaching out for things, maybe the same things I am, but having a, a community I'm looking for, uh, well, I call it my 10-year plan, for creating a village for living medicine. It can be any place in the world. Anybody can create a village for living medicine according to their uh, concept of what that means. To me, it means that the men, you, this place on earth, when you step on the ground on that 
earth, your healing starts. And your healing starts because other people who have come into this community are looking for the same thing that you are. They're looking for how love brings them together, how joy and happiness is part of what they're really looking for. And if they find something that is um, not working, they take care of allowing it, not just getting over it or uh, letting getting rid of it like a disease or something, but what is it saying to me? What is what what am I? What can I learn? From, from this particular aspect of my life. And um, to me, that's an ongoing process because, you know, life changes when you're, each, each, each day changes, it, each moment it changes. And certainly in a hundred years, it's changed. And so it's, it, it's that desire to see what else is calling the true humanity within us. And for me, it's a, a village for living medicine where I think we can find a community that's reaching the same way. It's so interesting because it's such a paradox to the way that a lot of the way society runs these days, even medicine, the way we have different specialties and silos and even people that are spending quality time with family and friends. You know, we live in these homes and we have these fences and everybody is still relatively siloed in their own world. So it's just such a different way of looking at life. Well, you know, a neighbor of ours just right across the street a couple of years, weeks ago put out a box on a post and it's and in that box, they have put uh, books that they've read and said, take one and, and uh, bring one back or something like that. And they've started on this little box on a post outside of their driveway, a, a community library where we get, you know, our, the neighbors are switching books with each other and the community is starting to reclaim itself you know when you begin to do little things like that uh, all of a sudden they're big things and because they they touch people in a big way because we've put a, a book out in that and it's been put but it it starts a pr process of life that wasn't there all for years on Miller Road. And now it's you've got a focus of some place activity, a fascinating activity that is taking place. I love that. And I love the fact that we're taking ownership and doing what we can within our own world because it's so easy to go the other way and start looking at things like you know, politics or climate change or wars, all these things that as an individual, we can feel so helpless and that it's so out of our control. And the way you're looking at it is developing these communities and changing the people in our small world that we interact with and letting that ripple out. Yeah, because it will. It will. That's a beautiful way to look at it. And for somebody who feels like they don't even know the starting point, you talked about the library there. They feel like this is new to them and they feel disconnected right now. What would you suggest to them to get started today? Well, if, if, if the library concept rings a bell for you, at the end of your, uh, part, your driveway, set up a little... Uh, community library, uh, you know, think of what you could do. Uh, 
you know, maybe, well, uh, uh, think of what, the, no, I can't tell you what you should do. See, that's the thing. I can point you in a direction. Uh, you can read a book that points you in a direction. But unless you take that in and it connects with your position within you, your life force, your juice, whatever you want to call it, if it connects with that, then by golly, go for it. Don't don't say, well, I'm too tired or whatever. Start start where you are. Do what you can and see what happens. And you know, Christmas is coming around. Maybe you'll have a special way of lighting up some I I don't know, you know. It's something that you start thinking about and you begin to think about how it would make life better for people in your community, you know. Maybe you don't know who they are. Maybe they're neighbors that have come from Timbuktu and moved in, and, and you don't even know that they're there. And then you find out, you know, it, if you're looking for something, you find it. You really do, but you have to keep looking. Sometimes it takes a long time, but keep looking. Don't get up. A piece of your message I'm really getting from reading your book and listening to your other interviews and chatting with you today is being aware of the subtle, subtle pieces of life, whether it be taking time to think and feel what's going on within our body, pay attention to our dreams, which is such a contrast to today's world as a whole, where everything's go, 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 and keep moving forward, keep doing. What I'm really taking from, from all this is the need to slow down and to really listen to the subtleties in life. Listen to, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and to listen to yourself. You know, what is it you find yourself... Uh, wanting to do when you get up in the morning. And if you think there was nothing, well, then create something that you want to do. I mean, wow. When you think about all the things we can do, I mean, that you, I, you, and you, and you, it's all different. But, wow. When it put, comes together, it makes a amazing jigsaw puzzle. As you talked about starting a day there, it got me thinking about how you start your days to get it off on, on the best foot. Can you take us through what you would do once you wake up in the morning and how you go about entering a new day? Well, I, I wake up, and go to the bathroom, and then come back and and say my prayers and and go downstairs and eat my breakfast, which is uh, raisin bran and, and, and prunes and a cup of coffee. And then I just, whatever it's, now I could not have, a year ago, I could not have imagined that I'd be talking to you this morning. You know, it's, it, it's allowing life to come reaching for life and uh, and watching what happens and this is awesome and and so have making a connection like we've made so that the people that can are listening and watching can connect with us too <laughs> I mean, how great is that and so it's the so I'm not going to tell anybody what they are looking for. I, I'm saying, they're your eyes. Look for what it is that you're looking for. Listen to what they're saying. I have a woodpecker out here that's pecking on my house, and I, when, when I wake up in the morning, that old woodpecker is just pecking up, and I talk, tell him to go away. He's Peggy, you know, he doesn't pay any attention to me, but I'm paying attention to him. And it's that sort of a, of a 
dialogue that nobody else can have with that one woodpecker that's up there doing that one thing. As you were talking about the fact that a year ago you could never predict, you know, this conversation and us connecting like this, it got me thinking about the importance of having structure in life. You talked about, you know, your morning routine and and what you do there. But then what I grabbed from that is this balancing act that we all need to play with and leave room for spontaneity and leave room for life to unfold but then again, have a certain level of balance that comes from routine. Right. Yeah, you have to have your boundaries. You can't just be running around. But uh, it's it, it's amazing when you find that the, the, there's certain things that you know you really want to do, and um, maybe you have to go to work and you don't have time to do it. Maybe there's a little part of that that you can do on the way to work or something, you know. You may have a woodpecker you can talk to. As you went through your morning routine and how you start your day, you got into what you have for breakfast, the raisin bran and the prunes and the coffee. Take us through what your diet looks like as a whole. And then what's your evolution been over time? I assume, you know, 102 years, you probably had different periods of time where you've experimented like most of us do. Can when you talk you about that? six kids, <laughs> yeah. and you're the, the one that gets home f- from work and gets dinner on the table by 6 o'clock so that everybody could be there. That was one rule. Everybody had to be home by 6 o'clock, and they knew that if they didn't, they'd be eaten up before they got there. So it was that kind of a rule that, that went on. Um, my diet has been one. I I don't smoke. I I really don't like alcohol. There's things, that, but um, I like salads. I like soups. I like. I used to make a really good meatloaf when I was making food for my kids. Um, so it depends on on where. We are in our lifespan. Uh, now, uh, what I have is usually uh, a, a some kind of salad that it, it, salmon or, ch- or chicken in it or something besides the vegetables. And then a uh, dinner, some kind of soup. You know, uh, uh, just whatever is coming along that isn't so difficult to fix and that can be put together because my son is doing the cooking for me. So, you know, I told during the pandemic, I I told my children that they were the elderly and I'm the ancient one. So it's it's accepting what life puts out. But the fact of the matter is that I can't tell anybody what's right for them, because they have to find out for themselves. I have one son who can't eat garlic or onions. I grew up in India where garlic and onions were, you know, a real big part of what we ate, and all of my other kids could do it, but he he can't, so he doesn't eat garlic and onions. I mean, it's, it's a it's finding out what makes your gut happy. And sometimes a piece of chocolate is, is a good thing to make your gut happy. It's, it's not, you, you can't even tell your kids exactly what they should be eating. I, one of my sons, when he was about five, kept telling me that Eggs made him have, no, he was younger, made him have a headache in his tummy, you know? I mean, if you're paying attention to what your body is telling you, and you say, no, I, you know, thank you very much, but you pass it by. You're not going to just eat something that is ridiculous to 
your own body <laughs> if you're paying attention to it. That's what I'm trying to say. A couple of the big pieces I gather from what you just shared are one, this is an individual thing that we need to listen to our body and figure out for ourselves. It's not just a one size fits all. And two, it sounds like you're gentle on yourself when it comes to what you eat and when you eat. A lot of people that you know are in this health world and myself included to a point, get really regimen about the different foods we're eating and when we eat them and yada yada. It sounds like for you, embracing at least to a point the imperfection of the way you eat and, and being okay with that. Yeah, because I like it that way, <laughs> you know, and I find that it works for me. Now, uh, it doesn't work for everybody, um, you know, and my kids have all tried various aspects of being a vegan or a strict vegetarian or whatever and found out what worked for them and they've kind of incorporated that into their lives and, and it works so i when i when i was actively practicing medicine and a patient was having some G GI uh, uh, gut troubles, we'd talk a lot about what they were eating. And we'd point a lot of attention to, uh, you know, maybe too much fried foods or whatever. But for, uh, for me to say that nobody should ever eat French fries, uh, well, well, that that's stretching it. Um, you know, life is life, and 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 so I, I think a diet of French fries would be very bad, <laughs> you know. But maybe you're out for dinner, and the their French fries there. Don't condemn the food. Bless it and eat it, and see what happens. It's. Uh, Blessing the food is one great thing to do. You can, I think it's really important to di to be in a what I uh, uh, to dwell in gratitude, because I am so grateful for things that come up. And if I, you know, I grew up in India, where people were starving. And so I'm grateful for food. People ask me what I eat, and I say food, because it's it's the reality of what I and 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 it's changed through time. D different times in my life, I was doing one thing, and now I'm doing another, and so forth. So it's um, find what works for you. Be be really, really aware of how you, how grateful you are just to have the food that you're getting and bless that food and see how, how your body takes it. You know, if your body likes it too and you, your taste buds like it and so on and so forth, you're, you're in a pretty good shape. I brought up the imperfection piece related to food. Let's expand that out into healthy living in general, because I think this is a problem for a lot of people that beyond food now try and take on a healthier lifestyle and they want everything to be perfect and they want to be told exactly what they need to do, how much water to drink, when to go to bed, yada, yada. Talk about embracing imperfection and how that's a piece of this. Well, uh, maybe we won't, don't call it imperfection. Maybe we call it reaching for per perfection through life's st stress and journey, not stress, journey, as, as, 
as we really engage with our life's pattern, our life's journey, and find out what it is that's working for us at this, at, 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 you know, when I was living by myself, I ate differently than when I was cooking for six kids and whoever else they brought into the house. You know, it's, uh, it's a matter of being aware that what, it, what you really are wanting is that inner understanding that love surrounds you and you either accept it as a, a growing aspect of your very very being or you reject it and if you reject it why you rejected that maybe it was a matter of setting up boundaries maybe there was something that came along and you went, came to a place where no this is not right and you set your boundaries and you moved in a different direction um <laughs> I, when I, you know, was practicing medicine, um, because I, I, I retired when I was 86. I always said I wouldn't retire until I had something to retire to. So anyway, during that time, the whole concept of living medicine and so on was very suspect, very considered a woo-woo process and all. So I appeared before the Maricopa County Me Medical Society board several times, and was re reprimanded for what reprimanded for what I was doing, and, and so on. So this one time, I went th there, and they did the reprimand, which I took because I wanted to practice medicine, and and I was going to do it the way I was going to do it anyway. But anyway, um, I reached my purse and took out my key chain, which was uh, a, almost an instrument. It was a big key, key chain that I had. I had it in my hand, and I walked out with my lawyer out of the room, and one of the doctors came up, walking up to me, and he says to me, Now let me tell you something, honey. Oh, <laughs> he pushed a button <laughs> that was just waiting to be pushed. And I turned around and I said to him, don't you call me, honey. I said, I'm your peer age-wide and professionally, and I, you will not call me, honey. Well, the poor guy begins fading, and I turn around. My lawyer is leaning against the wall laughing. I came up to the office, and my daughter, who was my partner at the time, I told her, and she says, oh, Bob, she didn't, and all of this. But three years later, when I was called up for doing it, I don't know what I was doing this time, but something along the holistic line that, that was suspect, um, this guy was really nice to me. You know, I mean, he was friendly and so on. There are times when you... Something happens, and it pushes a button, and you know that you have to stand up for who and what you are, and and it works. So be aware that there are times when you take life as it comes, and you have to let it go. It just isn't worth it. It's it's just uh, it's, it's it doesn't matter, and it. In the book, I talk about a hand movement for that. But there are times when you simply have to stand up for what you really know works for you and is working for the, the, the life that you're leave, living. Dr. Gladys, that's a great place to leave things. I know I have to let you go, but... Before we part ways, I want to say it's been a true honor to speak with you today and share your wisdom back and forth. And I've just really enjoyed the conversation and I really Thank appreciate you. the work you've done and the work you're continuing to do. And it's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I appreciate, you know, all I've done wouldn't amount to a hill of beans if you didn't pick it up and run with it. <laughs> Take good care, Gladys. Now that you've finished my episode with the mother of holistic medicine, you're going to want to head over here and catch my chat with the father of integrative medicine, Dr. Andrew Weil. I'll see you over there. So the change that's happened now, all I can say is very, it's long in coming, you know, overdue. And